Well, that was a bit blown up, but <laughs> I'll take it. Thank you so much for the warm weather that you've provided me with. It's really wonderful here. I came from four degrees yesterday to 20. It was like summer. I'd just like to open in prayer. Let's pray. Our dear great God, we thank you that we have the privilege in and through Jesus Christ to approach you, to be able to say, Father, Abba, Father. And we pray now, dear God, as we consider what you have done in the history of the church in Australia, that we may sit in awe and wonder and praise but also, Father, that you would give us a holy discontent, that you would give us a desire to see your spirit poured out upon us again, that you would quicken our hearts and that we, we may seek after you and that, Father, we may delight in seeing all around, inquiring, who is the Lord? What must I do to be saved? Father, we pray now, Open our eyes, open our ears, open our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, please just give me a minute. I've got to set up. Um, and in fact, I've probably been given a very difficult task. And I think me explaining it, I actually have some slides, which, if it's possible, yes, great. So it's a difficult task because there is so much to it. And you, you know, the, the whole matter of revival, Australia. And here I am saying, you asked me to deal with about 1800 to 1890 and talk about revival history in Australia, and there's a big problem. There's so much to it that I will not be able to fit it in in 45 minutes. And I've actually got to time myself because I can lecture for two hours without um, being conscious of the time. And so please bear with me as I set my... I'm not very good with the, these phones. Um, I've actually got paper. I'm, I don't use an iPad or anything fancy like that. So just bear with me and I'll... Set this time. Okay. So, 45 minutes. They may not want me to just speak that long. Um, by the way, I, I forgot to bring my Bible. And I'm staying in a really nice hotel. And praise God. <laughs> Gideons! Praise God for Gideons. Now, we're staying there for a few days... So I am going to return it. I'm not going to steal it. I'd like to draw your attention by way of starting with the Bible. And if we look at 2 Chronicles, and 2 Chronicles, we're at the stage and we're looking at chapter 33. And we're at this stage at looking at the kingdom of Judah. The kingdom of Israel, as we just heard, they're gone. And now we're dealing with the kingdom of Judah, the southern kingdom. And what we have there are the kings, and they're these kings that precede, two kings that precede the one we're going to focus on very quickly, Josiah. And 33 tells us the two predecessors. And the predecessors did not follow God faithfully. And the king that came just before Josiah only reigned for a couple of years, but he was atrocious. So he did far worse than his father before him. But we read about this young king Josiah. Eight years old, he comes to the throne. And would you believe this young man had a heart after God? In eight years' time, he really seeks after God. 
And then he gets a bit older, and by the time he's 20, he realises that what's going on in Judah is not honouring the one true God. So he goes on a rampage, a purge. The high places, gone. The Asherim, gone. The altars to Baal, gone. The, the metal and wooden idol statues, gone. A radical, radical reformation. But it doesn't stop there. His heart after God just yearns to be closer. So at the age of 26, he realises that the temple is in a state of utter disrepair. So he ensures that there is a rebuilding and the restoring of the temple. And as that happens, the priest Hilkiah discovers the books of Moses. And he rushes to Josiah and he reads these books. And Josiah's response is to rip his clothes apart as an act of mourning. And then saying, this is no good, calls for the priestess who's able to confirm that he needs to heed the, the law because the law says what has been done throughout the generations by the children of Israel has brought God's wrath upon them. And so he then decides that he is going to restore the covenant with the people of his kingdom. And so there he calls them and all the leaders and he himself reads through the law of Moses. As king, he realises that he's the federal head and responsible. So he does that. And consequently, the children of Israel agree that they need to renew the covenant with God. And so it is renewed. And it's so extraordinary. He actually then has them celebrate the Passover. And it tells us there, there had been not a celebration of the Passover like this since the time of the judges. Now, that's what it says in Kings, here in Chronicles. It says, since the time of Samuel. So basically, from when the Israelites crossed the Jordan, they had not celebrated the Passover like they had in the wilderness and in the time of Josiah. Now, the reason why I mention this story is because they had forgotten. The children of Israel had forgotten the law of the Lord. Now, by the way, Hezekiah, like three generations before him, did celebrate the Passover. And if you read about him, it says that no one had celebrated the Passover like that since the time of Solomon. So Solomon did a good job, but not to the letter of the law. And the law had been lost. And what were they going on? What were they going on? What the priests remembered? The important lesson here is that we can forget. And in the case of the history in Australia, of the church, there's been a lot of forgetting about what God has done in revival. Stories are important. History is absolutely vital. If you're a Christian, you have to love history. You don't have an option. And why? Well, let's consider the Bible. If that is our supreme authority, we need to consider it. And when we look at it, okay, what are the, what's the Bible made up of? 66 books. Well, of the entirety of the Bible, 43% is 
is narrative, is history, is story. 43%, the highest percentage. 33% is poetry. And then we have 24, the remainder 24% is prose discourse. You know, teaching kind of stuff, direct teaching. 43%, story is vital, it is part of our humanity. Story speaks to our hearts. Oh, when we read the Gospels, aren't our hearts warm about the stories of Jesus and what he has achieved? So we need to restore the true history of Australian Christianity, particularly Protestant evangelicalism. We've had some wonderful definitions of revival. I have numerous here. I won't go through them. You've heard some really good ones. It's important, but, to realise that down through the history of the Christian church, there have been many events which fit into this pattern and which in recent centuries have been called revivals. Revivals have also usually been the key to, the, to great growth for ch the church. The history of revivals and the results of these revivals is the history of the growth of the Christian church in its, in its true spiritual quality. The subject of church history, when it is approached this way, is always a cordial for drooping spirits. Now, as we've been told, they're also known as awakenings. And there have been three great awakenings. There's the ones under the Whitfield and Wesley and Jonathan Edwards around the 1740s. Then there was the Second Great Awakening, uh, which occurred about 1792 to about 17, uh, 1830. And then there was the Third Great Awakening from about 1857 to 1860. Now, these were in Britain and, the, and in, the, in America. But what is interesting is that third great awakening Australia participated in. And I will spend a little bit of time on that. There is this myth that Australia has never experienced revival. And can I tell you, with my historian hat on, that is incorrect. It is historically inaccurate. It is a stereotype, and that has obscured the importance of religious revival in Australian history and that idea that there's never been a revival in Australia. Now, I am originally from New South Wales. Go the Blues. I'm going to get killed. <laughs> um, but when I was in my early 20s, I went on a fly drive trip to Tasmania and did a driving tour of Tasmania. It would have been early 80s. And I went to this antique... I love antique books, particularly Christian books. And I went to this antique bookshop in Hobart and I pulled it out. And by that time, I was actually studying for the ministry uh, to be a Presbyterian reform minister. And I found this book and I was opening up a small book it was printed in Britain, and it was about 1860, thereabouts, and I was read, Revival in Van Diemen's Land. What? Now, I, I, I was absorbed all the Banner of Truth books and so on, and this came as a shock. And I'll never forget, unfortunately, I didn't buy the book for some strange reason, but I'll never forget, wow. I've got to examine that. I've got to investigate that. You know, there was no computers, no internet at the time. Um, but that set my heart aflame, that I was going to pursue this thing of revival in Tasmania, in Australia. Now, can we have the first few slides, please? I just want to point out some of the important works that are available on revival 
in Australia. The first one, which is the oldest work that I'm aware of, is by this fellow Edwin Orr. And that was published in 1976. Edwin Orr was an evangelist. And he came to Australia, you know, in the, in the um, at least the 40s, 50s, and had evangelistic campaigns in Australia. And he loves evangelism. He's passed away. But he's written this extraordinary account. And it's very well documented. And then you've got these two latest works. And uh, you've pro you'll probably come across Stuart Piggin. He's the authority on evangelical church history in Australia. He was my uh, supervisor for my PhD. And these are these two works, and basically they're authoritative on the history of evangelicalism in Australia. Uh, the, the first volume actually won Christian Book of the Year, Australian Christian Book of the Year, about three or four years ago. So I would recommend those. Can we have the, the next slide, please? These are by Robert Evans. He was probably the second fellow to really look into revivals. He was a um, uniting church minister, but basically a Methodist minister. And he had, he had this extraordinary appetite for revival and reading about revival and recording revivals. And those two works actually are available as PDFs. You can get them if you know how to, to search carefully the internet. You can get them as PDF downloads. And uh, that covers the early and the later period, but only stops at uh, uh, 1914. So I would recommend those, and you can access those for free. Uh, next slide, please. And there's this one book. Now, like all books, I don't totally agree with all my mentor has in there, but when it comes to examining the topic of revival, great book. As I said, I don't agree with everything in it, but you're going to find some wonderful stuff in there. So if you're after a work, it's not easily obtained, but it, it, you can get it. So they're just some works. And the reason why it's important is to see that there are these writings which clearly set the record straight. There are others. There are journal articles. I've written a couple of journal articles that are out there and are available. But let's consider this whole matter of revivals. And I want to put to you that four things. Firstly, that revival has been relatively frequent in Australian church history. Secondly, although revivals in Australia usually have been localised, their genuineness may be demonstrated from surviving sources of evidence. Thirdly, past revivals in Australia have raised the moral standard of whole communities. And then fourthly, revival has come as a form of social salvation to the marginalised, minority and underprivileged groups in our society. Now, can we have the next slide, please? What I've done here, and it's going to take three slides, is to tell you that we have documented at least 96 revivals over the period that we're looking at this evening. So from about 1830, because you've got to remember, Australia 1788, and it was only you know, convict ships that came. So it's taken a while. So 1830s, we come across this topic of revival, the occurrence of revival by 1830s. And it happens to be in Tasmania. But can we the next slide, please? Just, just look and absorb this. And these aren't all. There are probably many that we haven't, particularly when it comes around the time of 1859 to the 1860s. There's probably more places that we haven't included. And the next slide, please. OK. There's never been revival in Australia. Never. Well, you can see that there is documented evidence of at least 96. It's not true. Okay, so we'll need to dive into some of these revivals. And what I'm going to do a fair bit of the time here, and I haven't set my alarm, um, what I'm going to... 
what I'm going to do is delve into some of these revivals. And you'll have to forgive me because what I'm going to do is read some of these accounts. I want you to hear the first-hand accounts so you get the feel firsthand of what it was like. And as a good historian, primary sources are everything. So, let's go to the early ones. And Ian Murray is the one who provided this. Tasmania. Now, I am not Tasmanian, remember, so I'm not biased here. During the 1830s, largely under the leadership of three men, Nathaniel Turner. Nathaniel Turner, interesting man. What a heart for God that man had. Methodist. Okay, so these are three Methodist ministers. Now, fortunately, Tasmania had a good governor at the time. And that governor actually said to Turner, look, you know, I want, I want the gospel to be heard by the convicts. You have my permission to go to the, the road gangs and preach to them. So you can stop them from working. You have my authority and to proclaim the gospel of Christ to them. Turner took up that invitation. Anyway, he and John Manton and Joseph Orton, they made it their task to ensure that the gospel was preached. And it was through the ordinary preaching attended by the power of the Holy Spirit that God turned the hearts of people in Tasmania. And what's interesting is it predominantly was through prayer. And you're going to see this in these revivals. The importance, the significance of prayer. And so it's recorded. At six o'clock prayer meeting on the quarterly fast, the vestry was more than crowded and the people had to go into the chapel. So at the noonday service, several who had lately been brought from darkness to light um, made a sacred concert for prayer. The sacred fire continued to burn in the hearts of all present and it set us all aflame. On the Sunday, the 25th, the Lord worked not only in our local area, but in the areas of Longford um, and Hazelbrook, sorry, Hazelwood and in Glenorchy. There was very great prayer. There was concern in the hearts of people who were praying that God would bless their hearts. On the Monday morning following the Sunday, at six o'clock, a special prayer meeting for the outpouring of the Spirit was held and with blessed influence upon us. Our June quarterly visitation, I believe the best our society ever knew in this part of the world. Glory be to God. At our quarterly fast, the power of the Spirit came down so that many were led to cry aloud for mercy. Several souls found peace with God. The spirit of prayer was given in an extraordinary degree. Such wrestling and such pleading with God I have never held beheld in these regions. Our people seemed all on fire. At most of our prayer meetings, which were numerously attended, souls are crying out for mercy. At one meeting, a man and his wife were kneeling side by side. The man was made happy and immediately prayed aloud for his wife. She too found the saviour. Okay. Then Melville Street in Hobart, at the chapel, was ordinarily crowded on Sabbath evenings and special effort was put forth to secure a more copious outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Under the preaching on the first Sabbath evening in September, many were awakened 
And at the prayer meeting, eight or ten found peace with God. Throughout Van Diemen's land, there was a good work at the time. At Glenorchy, the darkness was turned to light. At New Norfolk, there for six months, they met at the courthouse and then built their own chapel. Mr Butters wrote from Port Arthur that more than 20 had begun to seek salvation. At Launceston, Mr Manton was meeting with encouraging success. Then in 1836, the Lord has poured out his spirit in a more glorious manner and many have been turned from darkness to light, from the power of Satan under the power of God. We live in peace. We dwell together in unity. Now, they're the earliest revivals that we have recorded. And you can see at this very early phase, because Hobart Town was, was basically created in about 1820. So we're talking 14 years later and we're seeing revival. And then we have the account, it's a famous account, of Parramatta in 1840. And we're going to come across this extraordinary man whose name is John Watsford. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? You're going to see him there. He's a bearded one. <laughs> Hipsters be jealous. And he was a young man. He wasn't in the ministry. I think he was about 19 at this stage in 1840. No, yes, he was 19, turning 20. And he was Australian-born, a Methodist. Strong emotion accompanied Watsford's ministry. Wherever he played his, his gospel message and entire sanctification, indeed, he saw the blessing of God. And he experienced revival. And the first experience he had was in 1840 at a service in Parramatta. And he and two friends decided together that they were to pray three times a day for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Watsford explained what happened. Now, what's really interesting, they had an old Methodist minister, a godly man, but he thought these young guys were too enthusiastic and too loud. So during the prayer meetings, he virtually never let them pray aloud. They were too enthusiastic. Well... This is what Watson records. At the end of the fourth week, on Sunday evening, the Reverend William Walker preached a powerful sermon. After the service, the people flocked to the prayer meeting till the schoolroom was filled. My two friends were there and on each side of me, and I knew that they had hold of God. We could hear sighs and suppressed sobs all around us. The old minister of the circuit, who had conducted the meeting, sobbed aloud. When he could speak, he called out, Brother Watsford, pray. And I prayed. And then my two friends prayed. And oh, the power of God that came upon the people who were overwhelmed by it in every part of the room. And what a cry of mercy it was. It was heard by the passers-by in the street some of whom came running in to see what the matter was and on entry was smitten down at the door in great distress. The clock of a neighbour of our neighbouring church struck 12 before we could leave the meeting. How many were saved, I cannot tell. Day after day and week after week, the work went on and many were converted. Now, when Watsford speaks about revival, it's bound up with the conviction of sin and conversion. We then come to, the eight, to 1859 when we really need to delve in and there is so much. So please bear with me and if I need to cut it short, I will do that but an extraordinary time. Just to set the scene, 
there was revival breaking out in the USA as a result of prayer in New York, which started in around at the end of 1857, and then eventually broke out in extraordinary revival. And then there was revival in the UK, throughout the UK, and in Northern Ireland, in Ulster particularly, extraordinary revival occurred there. And one of our heroes, Charles Haddon Spurgeon, partook of the 1859 revival. Well, there was news about that and it all came to Australia, this news. As a consequence, a conference of ministers meeting in mid-1857 resolved to pray for general revival and for themselves, seeking a richer baptism of the Holy Spirit, promising to pray for each other and to promote Saturday evening meetings for prayer. Now, of extraordinary awakening, the awakening in the United States in 1858 captured the attention of all Australians. By mid-1859, Christians in Melbourne and Sydney were reading the news of the awakening in Ulster and Wales, in Scotland and England. Sydney religious editors published a call for prayer saying, it will be a happy day for Sydney and New South Wales when a similar influence visits us here. In Brisbane, capital town of the newly separated 1859 colony of Queensland, which had a population of less than 25,000, the prayer meetings were small but fruitful. In New South Wales, prayer meetings abound. They were then in every town. United prayer, med- uh, United prayer meetings were held in the Anglicans, Baptists, Congregationalists, Methodists, Presbyterian churches and the YMCA. Prayer meetings were held in Victoria, in Melbourne, Ballarat, Bendigo, Geelong in 1859, interdenominational in character, but with the goodwill and occasional leadership of the Anglican Archbishop of Melbourne. Similar prayer meetings were held in Tasmania, both in Hobart and Launceston, and in South Australia. So great was the movement um, that in, an Adelaide minister rejoiced that the whole place is being turned upside down. Even in little Western Australia, there was intercession in their small churches. It was not long before the rising tide of prayer produced a flood of revivals throughout the Australian colonies. The Victorian revivals began in Brighton on May the 22nd, 1859. The extraordinary local movement began with testimony by revived believers. But before long, the cry of distressed souls marked the meetings. Special services were held daily. The chief human instrument was a layman by the name of Henry Baker, a Methodist. This movement spread from Brighton to Melbourne, a five miles away. Churches of all denominations shared in the work. An extensive uh, revival in our time was reported. When, in 1858, the great Wesleyan church had been opened in the city, its 1,700 seats were seldom more than half filled. But in 1859, conversions were reported in meetings in the place, and by 1860, the church was regularly crowded. A great gathering of converts occurred in Brunswick Street Church, also in scenes of Pentecostal power, again referring to the biblical Pentecost. During the 1858, the tiny Baptist churches in the city of Melbourne were struggling for very existence. In 1859, the revival changed the situation completely. And the Reverend James Taylor reported that Collins Street Baptist Church was compelled to demolish their original building in 1861 and build a much bigger building. Meanwhile, the enterprising pastor rented the Theatre Royal while the new building was being built. Baptists 
records in Victoria showed the founding of many Baptist churches in the 1860s. In only 10 years, the congregations increased from 7 to 27, while a couple of hundred new members were welcomed every year. The first business of the General Assembly of the Victorian Presbyterian Church in 1859 was to give thanks to the God Almighty for the work of grace going on in the United States and the United Kingdom and prayer for the like revival in the Australian colonies. As a consequence, by, the, by 1861, their 100 congregations that they had in Victoria each had approximately 200 members. That's how well they were being blessed by God. The prayer meetings in Melbourne churches and halls were followed by united evangelistic services in the city, in their theatres, which followed a London pattern. Thus, the great Theatre Royal in Melbourne was crowded out Sunday by Sunday in June 1860, with 50,000 attending a dozen services. And by the way, it didn't reduce the high attendance at their normal church services. As early as 1859, there was an awakening in Ballarat. The Reverend James Bickford reported on the deep searching before God in both the Wesley and Mount Pleasant churches, where a, and this is quoting him, a revival of God's work has broken out. Likewise, in other gold fields nearby, this is a quote, revival services full of holy zeal and fire were reported from the Golden Square Methodist Church in Bendigo. There, the ministry of the Reverend Richard Hart, which made a good start in 1860, was marked by glorious revivals, which continued long in the Bendigo area. A great and solemn interest characterised the movement in the congregations of the various denominations. In October 1860, an awakening commenced at Geelong with 200 cases of outright conversion, some of them very striking. The Reverend Joseph Dare became a noted pastoral evangelist by other ministers of various churches was sharing in the times of spiritual prosperity. In the Castle Main district of Victoria, there was an extensive revival of religion, which in Malden resulted in a remarkable ingathering of converts. In 1861, Reverend George Richards summarised the reports of blessings and the power of the Lord has been present to wound and to heal. There was such power in the preaching of the word that hearers repented and believed throughout the Castle Main district. District after district reported revival. It seemed that the Victorian revivals were followed, followed a pattern similar to that of Ireland with prayer meetings every night in the churches and all the phenomena of the Ulster movement except for prostrations. The Melbourne theatre meetings, of course, were in the vein, not of Ulster, but of London. And then we have the, the ministry of Matthew Burnett. And we read of a friend of his Standing equally high in the Methodist appreciation was the Reverend A.R. Edgar, in whose work in Victorian golf fields there occurred local revivals in which it was impossible to tabulate the results, which at least equaled the number of the day of Pentecost. Across the Bass Strait, the churches in Tasmania were moved in the prayer movement, followed by the revival of church life and the winning of many from the community. This movement of prayer and revival passed its peak in 1861. By 1864, a gracious revival occurred again in Tasmania, in Hobart, arising from a week of prayer conducted by Spencer Williams and from a week of prayer conducted by him they saw a 50% increase in membership amongst the Tasmanian Methodists in one single year. 
Other denominations grew in the revival. The Baptists in Launceston hel um, helping to establish other congregations in the northern part of the island. Population, of course, was thinner and smaller, but God moved. And then we come back to John Watts, the man greatly blessed by God. He'd just come back from an extraordinary triumphal ministry in Fiji. And he's back in Australia, 1859. And there he is at Goulburn. And during his time there, he experienced revival. And he records, when the power of God came mightily on the people, the first to come to repentance being the chief constable. And from there, he just went and visited Sydney. And he preached in Sydney, um, in Burke Street Congregation, where the praying men had been pleading with God for the outpouring of the Spirit. The church was crowded, and the mighty power of God came upon the people. Fifty converts professed faith that night, and many others were in distress. And this is what Watsford records. To a congregation which packed the building, I preached from quench not the spirit. What a time we had. The whole assembly was mightily moved. The power was overwhelming. Many fell to the floor in an agony. And there was a loud cry for mercy. The police came rushing in to see what the matter was. But there was nothing for them to do. It was impossible to tell how many penitents came forward. There must have been over 200. The large schoolroom was completely filled with anxious inquirers. It was the same in Maitland, 20 miles northwest of Newcastle, New South Wales. There the quickening came at a camp meeting and many were brought to Christ. In the smaller places, wherever an evangelist, evangelical church was found, there were meetings for prayer. Local revivals of a phenomenal sort began to occur in other parts of the colonies. Not only were there stirring times in Adelaide, in South Australia, but in the then second largest town, Coringa, later known as Burra, which became a ghost town, the Reverend J. Whittaker announced 500 conversions in three months in a most glorious revival of religion. Never such a one in this colony before. And the list goes on, and Watsford's involved in all of these. I could read on and on, but I need to be conscious of time. But the founding of the Central Baptist Church in Brisbane in the 1850s led to the opening of a suitable building in 1859, the Reverend B.G. Wilson being minister. The revival in Australia brought several years of prosperity to the Baptists and others in Queensland, as well as in Western Australia, even with its very small population. The revival of 1859 onwards established a pattern of spiritual renewal, especially among Victorian Methodists. The evangelists of the 1859 revival in Australia continued their work, whether Baptist, Congregational, Methodist, Presbyterian or Evangelical Anglicans. While much attention was paid to overseas visitors, by far the greater work was done by the Australian residents and by and large, by lay people. The mid-year, sorry, the mid-century awakening in Australia ended a new phase in 1863, one of organised evangelism with revival. And then we come across a fellow by the name of California Taylor, who was literally from California, a Yankee. And he came in, uh, in 1863, and he began his ministry, he started in Melbourne, and God blessed his work there. And he then went to Tasmania. Again, revival in Tasmania. 
In the year 1864, he spent in New South Wales and Queensland. And then in 1865, he went to South Australia. Again, revival, 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 wherever he went. Great was what God was doing. The year 1859 was the most fruitful in church growth, apart from the work of Taylor in 1863, 1864 and 65. No Protestant denomination failed to gain adherence and church members in those fruitful years of spiritual power. Extraordinary what God was doing. Then we have, and uh, we're going to see the gentleman next to... No, 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 back to that slide, please. Thomas Spurgeon. You may know, if you don't, that Charles Haddon Spurgeon, he and his wife, only had two children. They were twins. Thomas, this one and the brother Charles, named after his father. Well, at the age of 20, Thomas, being unwell, came out to Australia. And immediately he was asked to preach. And he preached, he preached in Melbourne, he preached in Tasmania, he preached in New South Wales. I think he preached about three times, three visits to Queensland, and all the places he went experienced revival. God was with him in his ministry down under. He then went across to New Zealand and they begged him to be their pastor of the Baptist church there. And he was there for seven years and they experienced an extraordinary revival in New Zealand under his ministry. So there is a Spurgeon connection. And as I said, you guys had him come up here three times. I think you were the most visited in Australia by Thomas Spurgeon. He ended up going back home to take over his father who passed away and he took over as the pastor of the Metropolitan Tabernacle. Now I have all these extraordinary stories about the Australian William G. Taylor, different to California Taylor, and because Tom did a wonderful job of talking about him, I won't go into detail, but I have details about the extraordinary work and the work done particularly up here in Queensland under his ministry, with so many people being converted. But... I think you get the point. Now, I have more material. I don't know. How am I going for time, people? I've got an hour. Well, it's actually 8.37. According to when I start this, which was about 20 minutes in, I've still got 17 minutes. Um, But there are all these extraordinary accounts, and I could go on about, about the people that came. There were all these extraordinary evangelists that came. So from about 1870 onwards, we saw this succession of overseas evangelists. And it's a long list. And these people I've actually investigated. Um, And I'll just give you a few. And this is a very short part of the long list. This guy, Matthew Burnett, Henry Varley, Alexander Somerville, John McNeil. And we're going to hear about another John McNeil, an Australian tomorrow. George Clark, Harry Guinness, yes, one of the Guinness family, if you like, Guinness Stout. But, you know, that that family, evangelist after evangelist after evangelist, and now we still have a life, still working, Oz Guinness, a wonderful apologist. God has blessed that family. And then George Mueller, Philip Phillips, Margaret Hampton, and Malia uh, Bazertz. Now, she was an interesting evangelist. 
She was a Jewess who became this extraordinary Christian. Hudson Taylor, Henry Drummond, and the list goes on. A, a, a colleague of mine in Tasmania um, has written, Elizabeth Wilson, did her, her doctoral thesis on, it's called The Wandering Stars. And it's about the English evangelists that came out to Australia. So many of them. And many of them were blessed. Were blessed. And this succession went from the 19, uh, 1870s all the way onwards and even into the 1900s. And these evangelists preached to crowds of five to 10,000. The question that you might ask is, were they responsible for the revivals? The answer is this, by and large, they came on the heels of revival. So the places they went to, God was pouring out his spirit and then they come and the work increases and they gather in more souls. And the Baptist church, it grew, it grew and grew. And as a consequence, Australia needed ministers. And where did we get them from? Spurgeon's Pastors College. And of all the countries that had the most students from Spurgeon's Pastor College, Australia had the most. More than the United States, more than South Africa, and South Africa were calling for ministers. We had 106 students come to Australia. So we see the way God worked. So we see this, this important feature that these evangelists are used. But what's interesting about this whole evangelist is that churches employed positions of evangelist. So they appointed, so the Presbyterians had, a, had an evangelist who went from colony to colony, because remember we weren't a, a national states at that time. Congregationalists created evangelists, appointed evangelists. The Methodists did the same. And all the other denominations. Extraordinary. But as I mentioned, probably the most significant church that experienced revival were the Methodists. And the question that can be asked is, why? Why the Methodists? And that's a really important question. And my answer is this, and this is coming from Stuart Piggin, and these various characteristics that they had. They were a successful missionary organisation. They were missional. You know, wherever they were, they were called to evangelise. That was everyone. They had a message they believed was the pure gospel. They had treasure and they needed to spread this treasure. They were a spiritual rather than a bureaucratic or liturgical movement. They were birthed in revival. When did they come into existence? Under the ministry of the Wesleys, Charles and John, and under the ministry of George Whitfield. Oh, what a preacher that man was. They said, he, they said that you, you'd just weep when he said certain words. But it was under... The Methodists were birthed in revival and they had the DNA of revival in them. And fourthly, they were a warm fellowship in which the laity as well as the clergy were expected to evangelise. And they had circuits. Okay, they established themselves. Well, we're not just going to preach here and let everyone come to us. They have lay preachers and a group, a list of people, the minister. And on horseback, they would go town to town and from homestead to homestead and would preach.
The beauty is revival in Methodist churches in Australia often broke out um, during ordinary church service of worship or in prayer meetings. Church membership was seen as a privilege and the responsibility of discipleship. Conviction of sin was taken seriously. Once you entered the kingdom of God, you didn't sit on your laurels. You were a disciple and you were called to follow your master. It was a privilege to be a Christian. A Christian equals disciple. And that's something I personally lament that in a lot of modern Christianity, you know, you can do discipleship courses like this is an optional extra. But we, if we are a believer, we are a disciple. We have a teacher, the greatest teacher, the Lord Jesus Christ, and we are called to follow him. And as a body, the church, we have been given our marching orders. Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel. They are our marching orders. Well, as I said, there's much more I can tell you. And I haven't really done my job as an academic historian. I could have done a lot of analysis for you, but I haven't done that. What I want to do is to have your hearts warmed. Warmed by the Holy Spirit. And tomorrow I'll talk about some of the vital things that we need to see, some of the, the beautiful um, fruits of revival the expectations that we should have and an examination of the qualities of revival. One thing I'm going to say, revival revolved around authoritative preaching. And I tell you what, a lot of the preaching today, and I've got a fair bit of experience, I've got the age to talk about this, is preaching there's so much wishy-washy stuff There's so much feel-good stuff or inoffensive. So you basically, you know, what are they getting at? Are they actually trying to call out sin here but they don't want to offend? And we see so much preaching like that. Well, when the Spirit of God is poured upon preachers, they preach with the authority, with the mandate of their king, Christ the prophet, priest and king. And the, you know, and the prophetic job is the job of the preacher. They speak with the authority of God, but of course it is subject, of course, to the word of God. An interesting one Puritan said, and, and it's important for us to read about revivals, but one Puritan said that providence, and that's the recalling of all that God has done in the history of the church, providence is our diary. We need to look back. God calls us to look back. When they crossed the Jordan, each elder from each of the 12 tribes had to pull out a stone, take it, and on the the bank of of, um, Jericho's side, they put them and they piled them up. And that was to be a a memorial so that when the kids said, what's that? They would say, that is when God led us out of the wilderness and into the promised land on dry ground. Look at the marvellous work of Yahweh. So yes, we need to read these things, to remember these things, and to claim these as our heritage. But also, the Puritan went on to say, but the Bible is our compass. It leads us on. And tonight we have seen by the two speakers before me the biblical basis for revival. I'm not just using church history. This church history I'm sharing with you has its foundations in the word of God. And when it's founded in that, then we know that we are dealing with true revival. Well, let's pray. 
Our dear God and Father, we thank you for hearing about what you have done in this nation in the past. This is a rich heritage and one, Father, we need to remember. We thank you that our nation, though a convict nation for settlement, did not remain in that vein. But shortly within this nation, you poured out your Holy Spirit and, Father, you had laid the foundations of evangelical Christianity as part of the substance of this nation. Father, may we repent as a nation for turning our backs on you, of forgetting what you have done. And, Father, may we rejoice in remembering in recalling and using this as a basis to plead with you that you would pour out your spirit to the ultimate glory of our God and King, the Lord Jesus Christ, who rules and reigns. Father, make us optimistic, not pessimistic. And may we pray as we saw What bathed the revivals in that early phase in Australia was prayer, prayer and prayer. And Father, make us a praying people. Oh, give us hearts to pray, to plead and eyes to see what glorious things you can and will do. And we ask this in and through our glorious Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.